The most imposing British colonial buildings in India, such as the Asiatic Society of Mumbai or the recently refurbished Hyderabad Residency, have a form that isn't British at all. They look more similar to buildings from Imperial Rome, with triangular roofs and towering columns. Architectural historians call this style neoclassical, it's a marker of how the British imagined an ancient empire and was a conscious attempt to position themselves as Rome's heirs. What might surprise you is that Indian empires did the exact same thing. Hampi or Vijayanagara, whose ruins have inspired many a tourist, photographer and historian, was truly an Indian renaissance state. It freely adapted elements from the collapsed Chola and Chalukya empires, creating a revolutionary new body of South Indian architecture. I'm Anirudh Kanisetti, historian and author of Lords of the Deccan. Welcome to Thinking Medieval, where every week we tell you something new about our complex, innovative past. Always feel free to check out our research and citations below and remember that we're all figuring out how to think about our messy, bloody, dazzling history. During the 15th century CE, two remarkable states emerged on the Deccan Plateau, Vijayanagara and the Bahmani Sultanate, on either side of the Tungabhadra River. Given their location in the Deccan, these states were multi-ethnic and multicultural from the outset. You see, for centuries prior, the Deccan had been a vibrant crossroads comprising three linguistic zones, Marathi, Telugu and Kannada. For much of the early medieval period, 600 to 1100 CE, Kannada-speaking dynasties like the Chalukyas and Rashtrakutas dominated the plateau through complex systems of vassalage and marriage alliances. Such decentralized systems had been the only way to control the arid, warlike and relatively non-urban region. But by the 12th century, they were no longer tenable. Each linguistic zone developed its own regional dynastic political structure, the Sayoni Yadavas in the Marathi zone, the Kakatiyas in the Telugu zone, and the Hoysalas in the Kannada zone. But even these states proved ultimately fragile. The Delhi Sultanate eliminated their political centers in the 14th century, and by the 15th, the Vijayanagara and the Bahmanis rose to fill the political vacuum. Vijayanagara, expanding across the South Indian Peninsula and reaching the Coromandel coast, capitalized on the allegiance of migrating Telugu and Kannada peasant warriors. As we've seen in a previous edition of Thinking Medieval, imperial expansion was not exactly a pleasant process. Though Vijayanagara texts like the Madhura Vijayam claim that Vijayanagara rescued Tamil Nadu, assimilating the vibrant urban and social systems of the region into Deccan domination took nearly a century. And the picture was equally messy in Bahmani territories, which is a topic we'll explore in a future video. To foster acceptance of their rule in Tamil Nadu, Vijayanagara strategically selected and patronized temple centers that commanded local loyalties. The great Nataraja temple at Chidambaram was one, the Ranganatha Swami temple at Srirangam was another. In the 16th century, Krishnaraya, a man of Tulu descent who became the most powerful emperor of Vijayanagara, wrote the Amukta Malyada, a Telugu courtly text about Andal, a Tamil Vaishnavite saint believed to be Ranganatha's consort. Raya cited a dream in which an Andhra form of the god asked him to do this while he was on campaign against the Gajapatis of Odisha. While devotion may have played a role, it's also possible to see in the Amakta Malyada a literary culmination of trans-regional politics, a Tulu ruler writing for a ruling coalition of Telugu warriors and Tamil priests. Last week, I travelled to the ruins of Vijayanagara with members and patrons of the Deccan Heritage Foundation. The trip was led by Dr. George Michel, a distinguished architectural historian and co-lead of the Vijayanagara Research Project. Dr. Michel pointed out that the earliest temples at Vijayanagara were very much in the early medieval Deccan idiom. In the foreground in this image, you can see a complex of funerary temples built by Vijayanagara's founding dynasty in the 14th century. Ignore the more recent temple tower in the background. Notice how the temple's main hall features a porch with a sloping roof and parapet walls flanking the entrance. For comparison, here's the 11th century Mallikarjuna temple at Sudhi, partially commissioned by a Chalukya queen, which has a similar main hall. You might also note that the proportions of the Vimana, the small tower or the sanctum, are quite similar. The Vijnagra Vimana, which looks, in Dr. Michel's words, a bit like a, a layer cake, is essentially a simplification of the structure of the older Chalukya Vimana. Its walls are undecorated except for a band of geometric reliefs. So far, so good. Both Vijayanagara and the Chalukyas were Deccan states, so this architectural similarity is exactly what we expect. But let's examine a 15th century temple, the Hazara Rama temple, an expression of Vijayanagara's imperial ideology built after its conquest of Tamil Nadu. More in this video here. 
The design of the wall is completely different here. Deep niches, once adorned with sculptures, are now framed by split columns. Between these niches, half columns emerge from sculpted vases. All these elements are alien to the Deccan, but they're absolutely native to Tamil temples. For comparison, consider the 12th century Airavata Ishwara temple at Dharasuram, where the treatment of walls is similar but more elaborate. Deep niches still containing sculptures are framed by split columns and interspersed with half columns emerging from vases. But that's not all. Here's a late 15th to early 16th century Vijayanagara temple dedicated by Krishnaraya's Tulva dynasty to the god Vithala. You'll instantly notice that its conception of a hall is completely different from the first Vijayanagara temple we saw. The parapet walls are gone. The vertical proportions are magnified. The pillars comprise multiple smaller elements, such as riders on top of fantastical creatures positioned at auspicious points. A secondary row of pillars is now decorated with miniature temples. Again, consider a comparison with the Airavateshwara temple. Observe the fantastical beasts on the outermost columns and then the ones closest to us. The logic is consistent. Outer columns offer protection and therefore contain frightful creatures, while inner columns have sacred figures. Vijayanagara has a much more evolved expression of this same underlying logic. What we can see in these stone structures then is a radical transformation of the Renaissance era South Indian temple, occurring at the same time that Vijayanagara emperors were making literary and religious attempts to integrate conquered cultures. I asked Dr. Michel about the reasons behind this architectural revolution. He pointed out that we can only guess at the motives of the Vijayanagara emperors. They left us no diaries. Perhaps they didn't find the older Deccan architectural idiom sufficiently imposing. Perhaps they found plenty of out-of-work Tamil sculptors willing to innovate to fulfill their new patron's creative vision. Or perhaps this new trans-regional empire needed a new trans-regional architectural idiom, one that outdid the Cholas and the Chalukyas, one that met the challenges for transforming world with a confident reimagining of South India's long imperial history. Temple architecture is not eternal or unchanging. It has its own logic and language, serving as a historical footprint to the ever-changing people who made them. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear them. Follow us everywhere on social media. You can find me on Instagram at Buddha and at Connected Histories, and on Twitter at Ekanaseti. We'll see you next week.